the New York Fed estimate for recessions from the yield curve. It's at 70%. That's the highest it's been since 1982, I think. And we haven't even got started and the Fed's still tightening, which basically implies this is probably going to be one of the worst recessions in our lifetime. To me, this is a setup for one of the biggest corrections in our lifetimes. We're now seeing more and more indicators that what's ahead of us may be the worst recession in our lifetimes, and it may hit as early as later this year. What's going to happen to not only inflation, but Fed monetary policy, the stock markets, Bitcoin, and gold? We'll be talking about all of these asset classes and what's going to happen to your portfolio with Mike McGlone, macro strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Always good to see you. Hello, David. It's good to see you, and thanks for having me back. Thanks for being here. A lot of people are talking to me about the risks of deflation, and you're one of the few macro strategists I've talked to who have gone over this risk in great detail. Are you see seeing signs of deflation either already happening or on the horizon? Uh, absolutely, yes. The producer price index is dropping at its fastest pace in history since 1948. Commodities, only three times in history, the Bloomberg Commodity in Index has dropped about 30% on a year-over-year -year basis. It was just there recently. And the first time was 1980-81 recession, a significant recession involved significant Federal Reserve easing, and then the global financial crisis, so the major financial crisis in 2008. So, um, and then we also have things like credit contraction, um, housing market peaking from the highest level ever, if you look at the case show and the FHFA housing indices, um, I think it's just early days for severe, significant deflation. And yes, I was wrong early on a couple of years ago. But now that we've had this biggest pump in liquidity that's dumping, it's logical that that should be happening. So I'll end with this. The world's the most significant measure of heat, electricity and fertilizer in this country, natural gas, it's dropped 80 percent from last year's peak. We haven't seen deflation, outright deflation in our economy for a while, have we now, Mike? So we haven't since um, the financial crisis, but the, the foundation for deflation now, I think, is the most significant in our lifetimes. Let's remember how we got this in these inflated assets. There was one key thing. Well, we locked down the world, locked down people, and then we just pumped the system with liquidity. Never have pumped that much system in, the, in this um, liquidity in the system ever. Money supply went up 40 percent. Condos in Florida landed in, in Indiana and the stock market all went up 40 percent. I mean, that's just the way it was. Now all that's going away. Money supply is declining. Bank deposits are negative. Um, so this is just a normal historical cycle of deflation. It's always in the back of too much inflation. And then the key thing is you look at yourself. So what usually stops it? Typically, you'll need a long and variable lag to central bank easing, Federal Reserve easing. And we still have most central banks still tightening. Last week, we had the Fed, ECB, Bank of Canada a week before that, um, Bank of England, you name it, they're all tightening rates. Um, with one exception, China, because China's have a more of a secular decline. So to me, that's the complete trajectory. Inflation declining rapidly, PPI is actually tilting negative on a year-over-year -year basis and interest rates still going up. Bodies in motion, interest rates going up, inflation dropping rapidly, and there's still one key missing link in that, and that's the stock market has to stay up. Because if it gives up the ghost, like it normally declines in a recession, that's your three strikes for pretty severe deflation. The key point is, I like to mention from our chief equity strategist, um, um, I'm sorry, Chief um, Economic Strategist um, Anna Wong is the Fed will be very reluctant to ease because of the sticky inflation numbers like personal consumption expenditures, employment cost indexes. Now, those numbers are still high, running around 5%, just below 5%. But see the trajectory Fed funds are above those levels and they're – Fed funds are heading higher, and those inflation numbers at the Fed are looking are still heading lower. Bodies in motion, which are potentially going to accelerate. So you wrote a recent piece entitled Cat and Mouse Game That Could Crush the Global Economy. Yeah. Uh, in your second paragraph, you, I'll just read the first sentence. Plunging commodities may be a precursor for severe deflationary forces on the back of a vigilant Fed focusing on sticky and laggy inflation measures. And you are correct. A lot of the uh, commodities that you mentioned already took a giant plunge. The question is whether or not the Federal Reserve actually did anything to bring down the CPI. I was I was looking at a chart, and I'll put this on the screen, courtesy of uh, Alpine Research, and they showed the PC inflation rate uh, alongside the Fed funds rate. And the Fed funds rate was rising 
coincidentally with the PC inflation already starting to roll over. And so the question is, has the increase in the Fed funds rate actually done anything to lower inflation? Well, absolutely yes, and does it matter? What matters is looking forward. So honestly, everything I do is, what's going to be my outlook for the next 12 months? The fact is they are still pulling liquidity from the system, and there's severe signs of deflating assets. Now, the one key measure, the bottom line measure that's keeping them stalwart against inflation is the stock market. That's the cat and mouse game. That's the lose-lose. This happened in July 2007. The Nasdaq bounced about as much as it did on its... 52-week basis, it's up about 34%. It did that in July 2007, and we know what the rest was history. The key thing is the Fed started easing in September 2007, and then everything collapsed as we held it towards a recession. And that's the key point is the bottom line is we're still fighting the Fed if you're long risk assets. Now, one thing I find very disconcerting, and this almost always happens in the biggest moves ever, i.e. 1930, is markets will go up into a, a like a wall of hopium thinking things will get better and ignoring the facts of history that stock market is bouncing into a recession as even started. You look like the, at the New York Fed estimate for recessions from the yield curve, it's at 70%. That's the highest it's been since 1982, I think. So um, you look at the yield curve and then there's so many indications here that you're supposed to be very careful yet investors are kind of double dog daring the Fed. And the bottom line is that's kind of the cat and mouse game. That to me is just like the stock, the commodity market, what turned out to be its worst enemy when it went up too much, it just squashed the man and brought on that supply and everything collapsed and still collapsing. That's a problem. Crude oil is down another almost 2% today. Um, the stock market is doing it in a, dim in a different way by saying staying strong and in, in, into this hopium that we're only going to get a soft landing or no recession. It's keeping the Fed vigilant, which I think is going to make aggregate things and make it worse. Uh, they're hiking rates well above their trajectory for declining inflation, which means just the normal cycles of don't fight the Fed are still don't fight the Fed. You look at Fed fund futures for the next money for July, they're still priced for 70% for 25 basis point hike. And the key question I like to ask myself is what stops, what's the number one force that can stop the Fed and a lot of other central banks from still tightening? And that's the stock market rolling over. Until it does, the Fed's probably going to remain vigilant. There's your cat and mouse game. Why, why, why would the stock market rolling over uh, force the Fed to pivot? I mean, it the Fed's concerned about unemployment and inflation. What, what's the stock market going to do for those it's, forces? It, it always has. It's the number one measure of forward-looking economic growth ever. I mean, look at the stock market crash of 1929, 1987, um, 1987, the Fed eased. That's when we really started this cycle. The last two times the stock market dropped, the last like 14 times it dropped 20%, the Fed was easy. That's what just the way things work. That's what's changed, David. That's one thing I make 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 very clear to people who've been buying this dip since 2000, the, the, the low in 2009. Every time you've had a 20% correction, it's been the absolute right thing to do. But every single time, the Fed was there to ease and help you. Not this time. Now, the question, you brought up a very good point, which is that the futures market is still pricing in one more rate hike by July. The question is why? Like you said, deflationary forces are already setting in. Commodities prices are going down. PPI and all the other, uh, these other indicators are pointing towards disinflation, if not outright deflation. Why does the Fed need to continue raising rates? It's a good question for them, but it's leading, ver leading versus lagging. They still see these measures of inflation. They watch mostly personal consumption expenditures, employment cost indices as very high and sticky. And they are sticky. Um, and they're not looking at things like I look at, like plunging PPI. I mean, it's never dropped this fast ever since 1948. So... PPI is basically a two beta to CPI. So it's really more of a question for the Fed, but this is classic human nature. What did they do before? They stayed low for too long, even though the stock market kept tick tickling up and showing in 2020, 2021, showing that there was massive liquidity in the system. They probably should have lightened up on the easing, but we had a fear that everybody was going to die. Now it's the opposite. They're trying to squash that inflation, but typically they're behind the curve. It's traders, it's hedge funds, it's money managers that are ahead of the curve. And I'm just ex-hedge fund guy, ex-guy who's on the phone all my life with traders. This is what I think most of them are looking at. This is what I'm looking at. It's the forward-looking measures that matter. Um, and that's why I'm worried that the only thing that's really going to stop them is when the stock market goes down. Uh, well, your report indicates that this cat and mouse game could crush the global economy. Could you expand on what you mean by crushing the global economy and what exactly is going to happen? 
So it's already happened. In the U.S. tilting for a recession, the yield curve from the New York Fed measure shows 70 percent chance we're going to have a recession. Now, if the U.S. goes for into a recession, what happens to the rest of the world? China, the best customer for China is U.S. and Europe. They're both tilting that way. And also, they kind of upset them with accepted um, ep- upset them with supporting Mr. Putin in his war, the f- unlimited friendship between Mr. Z and Mr. Putin. So there's major divestment out of there. And you ask yourself, is what central banks are, what's every central bank on the planet doing with exception China? They're all just trying to catch up the Fed. So to me, it's that power of the U.S. economy might be stronger than ever, certainly from a monetary standpoint. So if the U.S. tilts for the recession, the rest of the world has a strong, severe illness, maybe a cold. Maybe the U.S. gets a cold, the rest of the world gets a... Um, um, gets COVID. I mean, this is just the way it usually works, but also they're so dependent on this demand pull economy. So um, the key thing I like to point out is I think it's illogical to expect just a mild recession after the greatest amount of rate hikes ever on the back of what caused those rate hikes, the biggest pump in liquidity that's dumpy. Um, so I fully expect just a reciprocal recession, just like we had in 08 and 09, like we had in 2000 to 2002, that area, um, and maybe in the 80s, which means a pretty normal drawdown in the S&P 500 peak to trial is 50%. It's done that twice in the in the last decade and last since the beginning of the millennium. So to me, that's what I, I think we should expect. And also the bottom line is, David, the market completely is not priced for that. So as a strategist and a money, money manager, money manager, market's already priced for the stock market to go up a lot. It already has. If you look at the NASDAQ relative to its 200-day moving average, it's about 25% above that level. It hasn't sustained that high on a short-term basis, 200-day moving average, since back before, the, since the uh, stock bond, the, uh, the internet bubble. Um, and so it's just an example how expensive things are. You look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index right now, today on a, on a 52-week basis, it's down 20%. The S&P 500 is up 20%. That divergence almost never happens in a, com- in, in a recession. So here's what we see. We have bond markets, inverted yield curve, credit crunch, commodities all point to recession, and the hope on the stock market. So where's the risk there? Risk reward versus I think is that the stock market is going to tilt towards what's really happened for a recession, towards deflation. And to me, that's my base case. Now, if that doesn't happen, it's wonderful. But to some extent, you have to admit with the stock market up, uh, and NASDAQ up over 30% this year, 38% this year, it's pretty well priced for a Goldilocks scenario. I've I've heard from other strategists that this has been one of the most telegraphed recessions ever in the sense that a lot of people share your viewpoints and have been analyzing this. And so what makes you think then that the stock markets haven't already priced in a recession? I'm looking at the S&P 500 right now. Uh, The current level in the NASDAQ, why do they not reflect an expectation of a recession, Mike? Let's look at the last two recessions. Um, you look at the NASDAQ, it bottomed and got down to about 40, dropped on a 52-week basis, about 50%. And from peak to trial, the S&P 500 dropped about 50%. The big difference is at this stage, say if the recession starts in a month or two, the, the Fed had already started easing. And there's not even price for that yet. So here's the lead and lag. We have not, I haven't lived, I'm only 58. I've never seen this. Now, there was a decent tightening cycle in 1994, but it was for good reason, and it worked out fine. This is much different. Um, and it's, it's, it's just taken that liquidity away. So that's my point is that um, the market's already, it's broadcast, and that makes sense. But I think what it's way, people are way underestimating how severe it will be just based on the lessons in the cycles of history. And the bottom line is, Booms and busts always come on the back of liquidity that dumps. And we've just never had ever extremes near the last pump in liquidity that's dumping. So to me, I'm putting the history in there. And also I look at what's happened in, in, uh, in history in 1929, 1930, the S&P 5, uh, I'm sorry, the Dow dropped 50%. It bounced 50% to the 1930 high. You have to do that in human nature to make people feel good about a false narrative. And then the, the rest is history. It did similar in, 19, in uh, 2007. The uh, Nasdaq bumped up to similar. It is now almost a third uh, 30% or so on a 52-week basis, and then rolled over. Um, so to me, this is what this, the setup is. If we put it this way, if the S- S&P 500 was down 10% in the year, the Fed probably would have started easing already. That's the point is we're not getting that liquidity to pump. The bottom line for all risk assets is the liquidity that helps boost them, and the liquidity still be taken away. That's the bottom line. Could it be possible, Mike, I'm just throwing a scenario out there, could it be possible that if we enter an economic slowdown or an outright recession, the Federal Reserve would want to stimulate, and that may actually put upward pressure on equities? 
Yeah, that would be great. Um, that's what's happened in the past. That's changed. Why? Because those inflation numbers are sticky. Also, you look at things like um, what's one, one number one measure, number one component in this consumer price index is owner's equivalent rent. It's at 8%. It's never been higher. I mean, never. Ever been higher than 8%. Where's that going to go? It's only one way for that to go is down. And you look at really what drives owner's equivalent rent. Housing. Housing just a year, a year and a half ago was never up as much as it was. I, mean, I think it was 20 or 30% on the annual basis. All tilting back over. Yes, we're seeing little bounces. But yes, that could happen. But at the risk of bringing out inflation. So here's the narrative we're going to hear the rest of our lives, I think. And that is the Fed will never ease with the ease they have in the past because of the risk of inflation they help create by easing too much and staying too long for too low for too long up until they started hike rates in uh, March of 2022. This is from uh, S&P Global Intelligence. The number of companies in the U.S. filing for bankruptcy just hit a uh, 12-year high on a month-to-month -month basis. Uh, this is alarming. W w when you see a stat like that, do you think that uh, A, recession coming, or B, uh, good buying opportunities for a lot of distressed companies? Severe recession, unless you have a major pump of liquidity and some significant action to help arrest that trajectory. So bankruptcies are increasing, right? That's just getting started. Despite the economy expanding well and the lowest unemployment in, what, 60 years? Picture yourself 12 months from now, David. What's going to make that trajectory stop? Typically, it takes a massive amount of Federal Reserve e easing and a decent lag to that easing. We haven't even got to that point yet. So that's a key trajectory. I'm glad you pointed out. That's a deflationary trajectory that shows no signs of stopping until and then or less we have a some signs of liquidity pumping from the Fed. And typically when they start pumping liquidity, it still takes probably a year for bottoms in most risk assets. So what I think you see pointing out there is just the beginning of one of the greatest economic resets of our lifetimes. What what kinds of companies will be left after this reset, Mike? Well, that's the key thing I like to look at. When there's, there's simple things like that is that's more um, – obviously, we're seeing what's happening is markets are going for the majors, the, the, the large caps. But I say – you know, I look at it as the U.S. two-year note right now is 4.7%, which means if you put $100 in the U.S. two-year note, two years from now, you're going to get $109 approximately. I'm like, there's certain times in, in life you should just – underweight, I think potentially underweight risk assets, all risk assets, and overweight risk off assets like gold and treasuries. And to me, this is one of those times, ride it out. Um, and then two years from now say, hey, McGlone, you were wrong and we missed out on the rally. Or you can say two years from now, McGlone, you were right and just don't even say anything. Yeah. Does this remind you of 2001 when we had a bunch of tech of stocks that, okay, it, so so it's not that all companies will disappear, but we will be left with the winners, right? Well, of course, it always happens. That defining which companies will work out is a little more difficult. And oftentimes what you see is the narrative of the biggest companies. I remember when GE was a big thing in 2008 when they missed earnings and they were a big conglomerate and mattered a lot. Now they're basically off the radar. Who cares? It's more thanks. Um, where's that going to change in the next 20 years? So I think it's very appropriate to compare um, what happened to the pump, the peak in, two, in uh, 2021, 2022, right before the Fed started tightening, to 2000 in the NASDAQ. Now, that was the internet bubble. And a lot of those companies went under. Just, I see that in cryptos. We have 25,000 cryptos. Most of them are just massively, highly speculative digital assets that need purging. That'll come, um, and that's why the Fed is still tightening. That's the bottom line for people who are looking to buy the dip because they've been trained to buy the dip for the last decades because the Fed was always there to save them. To me, this is the Fed. This is time in history. The Fed is even generally kind of indirectly stated. It's time to cut that umbilical cord where the number one thing that matters for investors is what the Fed's doing. It's going to go back to the good old days of good organic supply and demand and markets and uh, organic uh, companies to to create money rather than what you mentioned, bankruptcies. Look at the Russell 2000 index. A lot of those companies are insolvent. And we're getting the purge that you need in capitalism for that foundation for the next rally. But it's going to take, to me, this is a setup for one of the biggest corrections in our lifetimes. And I mean, look at the 87 crash. That was basically one day. It led to a recession. It was south and the Fed started to ease right away.
It's different this time. What's different is it's very similar to 1929, 1930. Everything's tilting lower. You mentioned bankruptcy and what's the Fed doing? Ben Bernanke warned us when he wrote his essays in the Great Recession is they were pulling back in money supply, central banks on a global basis, right when they should have been adding. That's what they're doing. I'm going to turn to the markets now. Another recent report you wrote, Macro and Five Charts, Stock Market Dependence. The first point is interesting. You mentioned all the downside risks for the markets, but yet you pose this question, can the NASDAQ lift all boats? We know that the NASDAQ has been rising. We know that a few names within the S&P 500, with particularly the tech stocks, have been lifting the entire index. Should the NASDAQ continue to rise because of the AI optimism or other optimism uh, surrounding tech stocks? Can that lift all the other markets? No, it- it, it reminds me of that's where the cat and mouse game is. And there's obviously major concentration risks. There's what eight stocks accounting for 90% of those rallies and similar in the stock in the S&P 500 and cap weighted basis. You look at the equal weight indices or the Russell 2000, they're all not doing that. But this to me is part of the lose lose that I'm really concerned about. You look at that NASDAQ 100 week moving average, it's starting to tilt over. The Fed's never tightened when that happened. Okay, we're seeing it. It's different this time. I remember having similar with things like uh, fuel cell stocks. Some of them never went above those highs and fuel cells have been around for 50 years. I remember hearing about AI when I was an undergrad in the in the 80s in college. My neighbor was really into it. Now I think it's somewhat revolutionary just like the internet but the NASDAQ did from the 2000 high to the 2002 low drop about 80 percent and then it took 13 years to take out that high. I think we're in a similar situation. It's going to take maybe a decade to take out some of those highs. It could make a new high and then go down 50 percent but that's where it's a little bit dicey. Um, and that's why I think that's where that cat and mouse game is. You just look at a chart of the last two, any time we've had similar type of env- environments like this. The Fed was easing aggressively. They're still tightening. So just a, simple. It's not complicated. Don't fight the Fed if you're bullish long assets. If you're buying NASDAQ at such lofty levels after going up one third and at what looks like potentially is a dead can't can't bear market bounce. You're basically saying what everybody keeps telling me is, oh, the Fed's going to save us and the cut rates when they when we need it. That might not happen. In fact, I don't think it will happen. Uh, you've also looked at the technicals of the market. So uh, can you tell us what's going on with the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ? We're seeing a bit of a decline today, but last week was a, was a great week following the Fed announcement. What can we expect in the short term? Is there momentum still on the upside or not? The thing you really have to be careful when you look at technicals, I look at everything is the narrative that you're supposed to, the market's going to go up because it went up. That's what you're seeing in technicals right now. I've seen it from everybody. I saw a lot of people get really bearish and point out those sentiments really bearish back in Q to Q, Q3 last year, but now that it's up, I sense that the masses are bullish. But what's the fundamental underpinnings? Is it up because of Demand pull um, economies expanding. Yes, it has been expanding. Or is it up because people are just buying into that hopium the Fed's going to ease? To me, it's more the fundamental cases of recession hasn't started. Yield curve says it's going to start. Our Bloomberg's economic team says it's going to start in a few months, and it's going to be potentially one of the worst of our lifetimes. And that environment, when you get a bounce in equities, you're supposed to say thank you. Typically, historically, history has proved you're probably better off lightening up. But that's the key thing I like to point about all technicals right now. The fundamental underpinnings, I think, are some of the worst I've ever seen. The Fed is still tightening. We haven't even started this recession. Yes, it's widely broadcast. It might be the worst ever. And that narrative that market's going to go up because it went up. Be careful. How do you respond? How, how do you respond to the um, observation that if you take a look at the CFTC Commitment of Traders report, the net speculative positions on the S&P 500 are net negative and have been the okay. most negative for the longest time since, I think, 2016, yeah. according to this chart. And so that means that people have nothing to do but to buy back shorts. Exactly. That's what this is. is a massive short covering rally. I've seen a lot of them in history. They have to drive you crazy. Um and cover all those shorts, make it very difficult for people to make to lose money rather than just a simplistic t- thing sometimes to do, and that is just lighten under underweight risk assets and overweight risk off assets like the U.S. government. You know, but this is what always happens, David, in human nature and micro- market cycles. Is it's very difficult for people to depeg from what's worked for the last couple decades, certainly for the last decade, what's made them look like stars and feel wealthy. Um, that's what's changed. And I think the market hasn't gotten yet. So when we speak, I think by the end of this year, it's going to really show up um, in maybe even a month or two. But I'm, this is not just a minor correction I'm looking for. I fully expect the S&P to head more towards 3,000, which is a normal correction, um, follow kind of what the guidance from copper and crude oil and natural gas, but most notably copper. 
um, and the yield curve. And the problem is the more it stays lofty, the more it keeps the Fed vigilant, which is more likely it's going to make the recession worse. So 3,000 on the S&P, uh, but you said that um, it's going to correct 50% peak to 12. So you're, you're taking the yeah. maximum 4,700 from 2021? Down yeah, to so 3, there's 000. more room, but 3,000 is a first round error, I think. You oh, I see. Expecting and because vir virtually all the strategies now are bullish, <laughs> that's yeah. usually how it happens. When market goes up, they get bullish. Um, so that's what you want to do. I mean, okay, yeah, the speculators you point out have been short, yeah, of course, because also they're buying puts to hedge their clients, um, because they didn't do as much of that they should have last year, so now they're trying to look good. But it's classic human nature and classic cycles. And I think it's the bottom line, like this thing is never forget from where you came from, where you're from. And that is um, this liquidity dump is still happening on the biggest. Yeah, yeah, I was just, I was just wondering where you're taking the peak from. So peak to 12. Yeah, peak uh, from all time 50%. high. It okay. usually drops 50 percent. So it did right. in 2000. It did in 2008. S&P 500 dropped about 50 percent peak to trial you know, twice since the beginning of the, the uh, millennium. And that's what people think have forgotten. We haven't had a decent bear market since the bottom in um, 2009. Now, we had a few corrections, but every single time the Fed saves us. Markets way overdue for just a normal bear market. I we're I lived through a few of them where it stays down, gets down, and everybody gives up. And we're nowhere near that. There's just, I mean, yeah, you're seeing some of the traders, the sentiments bearish, but the analysts, this typical sell side analysts, are all doing what they're supposed to do, and that is keep riding it until they're stopped out. And what's it take for just like people getting bullish because prices are going up? People get bearish because prices are going down. I think that's and I think that's what's going to happen. Gold. I think people get really bullish gold the higher it goes. But I think it's a little more fundamentally. Um, a good foundation because of the tilt towards what happens to recessions and that's what's normal recessions and deflation. Now, here's something I like to point out is some equity strategists are pointing out how declining inflation is so good for equities. And I like to point out, well, that's what happens in depressions and, and uh, recessions is inflation drops rapidly. Don't think they figured out my view is I don't think markets figured out that's why inflation is dropping so fast because economic growth is collapsing, particularly on a global basis. Just look what's happening in China. Everything's disappointing. Yeah. And uh, OK, so let's close off on Bitcoin and gold now. So I have to point out that the uh, Bitcoin price today uh, around looking at the chart, 27,800 close to 28,000. It's up about 4% on the day while the NASDAQ is down. And in fact, the NASDAQ and the Bitcoin price have been diverging for, I think, three weeks now. So tell us about this divergence. What does this mean? So what I'm concerned about with Bitcoin is this is um, since the BlackRock announced their application for an ETF, Bitcoin's dropped from 25,000 to 20, almost 28,000. That makes sense. Oh, about 10%. But that's still hoping. We have to hope to get that ETF. It's probably going to happen now because it's BlackRock. We're all in there and everybody's think, thinking that. But if you look at Bitcoin versus the NASDAQ, that ratio, it's like 1.7 or so. It's the same as first traded in 2017. So I'm big picture macro bullish Bitcoin. But I think the problem is if I'm right about risk assets declining in a normal recession, cryptos are the riskiest assets. Bitcoin's the least risky. I think they still have a lot of downside risk based on my view of a serious U.S. recession. Now, at some point, Bitcoin's going to come out of that and trade more like gold and long bonds. Is this the time? Maybe. But it's got it's, it's to show me more divergent strength. Like today's one day. Nasdaq's down two tenths and Bitcoin's up four. That's one day. But overall, you look at Q2, Bitcoin's had a horrible quarter and Nasdaq's been up. And why? Okay, so we've had federal, um, we've had the SEC crackdown. Yes, that makes sense, but that shouldn't really hurt Bitcoin. It should really help hurt the other cryptos, the other twenty-five thousand that are just fully, you know, way over hyped and speculated. It's just too much. Seriously, speculation. I remember I used to see a lot of the trading pits. This makes those like uh, that hype look like sissy stuff. So. Um, th that to me is we need to get through that period. But right now there is not that ETF that people are bidding Bitcoin on. And it's the overall whamling macro that I'm concerned about that if I'm right about markets just doing what they normally do in deflationary recessions as indicated by the yield curve and commodities and Fed still tightening, Bitcoin's still going to have some major pressure factor. And finally, you wrote that the gold price could near S&P 500's level in a recession, I believe you're talking about the gold to S&P 500 ratio. Uh, what, what does this mean exactly? So here, here's the um, narrative. Gold versus the S&P back over 100 years has been as high as, um, I mean, S&P divided by the, by the gold is basically, the mean is about 1.2. The high has been about 1.3 and it's around the, the low right now. Um, 
S and P is like double the price of per ounce of gold. So here's one scenario for the recession I'm looking for: gold pops to three thousand, S and P drops to three thousand. That's a one to one ratio. And if you go back a hundred years, that ain't much. Needs to be pointed out. You don't earn interest in the gold. You don't have dividends in S and P five hundred. You do that. I'm just pointing out the fact of the ratio of the two assets. The num- the most significant measure of risk assets on the planet is the S and P five hundred, and it's maybe double the price of gold right now. As we head towards a recession, I think they're going to head towards one, which is not profound. I mean, one-to-one parallel ratio um, per ounce of gold, because that's almost always what's happened in recessions. And we haven't even got started and the Fed's still tightening, which basically implies this is probably going to be one of the worst recessions in our lifetimes. It could either mean that the uh, S&P is going to crash significantly or gold goes up significantly or both. They meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be... Right now, I look at it. My opening up my potential crystal ball. I think it's more likely gold goes to three thousand. S and P five hundred goes to three thousand. Now, that's going to see a lot of um, iterations, and that's the risks of making predictions. But this is what I see right now, and part, particularly because there's virtually no one who is um, bearish the stock market. I mean, they have been, being like the strategists, and that to me is where you should get good bear markets. Is when you have a fundamental underpinnings for a very bad period for equities, if you just follow the rules of liquidity and recessions, um, of course, most strategists are smarter than I am. Um, <laughs> we'll find that true. out. They, they were they were a lot smarter than I were was in 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 uh, crude oil until it peaked at 120 and it dropped to 70. I just was a little bit wrong and early or both. <laughs> it took a while. So here's a question I like to ask our, our readers. So how did all these? I mean, the top strategists on the planet get crude oil so long and commodities so wrong. How do they do that? What does that mean? It means they missed the demand pull, lack of macro demand pull for commodities. Now we're seeing this this expectation that we're going to have not have a recession, yet I think they're missing the same thing, the lack of demand pull and the overdue period for a decent stock market, um, bear market. We haven't had one since the bottom in 2009. It, it, okay, let's close on this. If you had one question for the investors and traders watching this right now, who's going to usually respond in the comments down below, what, what, what would you like to ask the crowd right now? Um, are you being realistic about your views for recession and um, asset allocation, or are you focusing on what's helped and done well for at least the last almost 15 years with the Fed being there to save you everything every time something went down? Um, and that is, I think, the key question that investors need to ask themselves. And I hear it so much. Everybody keeps telling me, oh, you got to buy equities because the Fed is going to cut rates as soon as the market goes down. The Fed put is still there. That's what I like to point out in that, in that piece you pointed out is I think the Fed put's gone. And let's give it a test. We haven't had a test. And let's see what happens in the test. And that's why I'm looking for that test of Bitcoin. If we get that roll over in equities, if we can see divergent strength in Bitcoin for the quarter, so far Bitcoin's un, um, is trading very poorly. So to me, that's the key thing. Is It's also what I fully expect. It's human nature. It always happens. It's just sometimes you can see it and expect it, and then you have to find it in the data. Um, it's like, why did some of us fully expect a massive amount of demand destruction in, in commodities last year and decent amount of supply elasticity to pick in because of price. Price just always makes that happen. The key thing I like to ask, point out is that happens more than ever now because of rapidly advancing technology. Obviously, that's good for things like Bitcoin and NASDAQ in the long term, but the short term, shorter term in the next couple of years is getting through this period of economic contraction in the U.S., which is completely being orchestrated and planned by the Federal Reserve, which is still taking away the punch bowl. Excellent. All right. Well, Mike, uh, thank you for asking your question. Please respond to Mike's question in the comments down below. And where can people follow your work and read more about uh, your thoughts? Well, first on Bloomberg Terminal, um, on LinkedIn, and um, um, Mike at, at uh, Mike McGlone eleven on um, on Twitter. All right. We'll put the uh, we'll put those links uh, for your for your social media accounts down in the descript- description down below. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent as always, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you, David. Appreciate being being on. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.